Well, welcome to another week in our series. I, I've, I've had several people say, uh, you will not be able to stand on this platform and preach. And uh, I am here to try it one time and see how it goes. As I walked in this morning, I was like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Uh, Jason is ready to bring that pulpit right there if I, I feel like it. But after so long of being used to being so close uh, to you and being able to reach out and and spit on you in the front rows. Uh, no one, I'm going to shower the flowers here. So, but anyway, uh, we continue our series on live your calling. What on earth am I here for? And I thought about forgoing this series today and, and preaching a message. Where do we go from here? That's answering the question that I think all of us kind of have now. We've had this this huge day in our church history, and it's kind of like, okay, now it's back to normal, what, what do we do now? And in the building, I'll just tell you, here's what we're going to be doing on, uh, working on. We're going to finish up on the things that we've already bought and paid for. Everything on this side of the building and the bathrooms to complete them has been purchased or is in the, was in the process of being purchased. I don't think all of the checks were written, but things have been ordered and, and selected. And we're going to finish up on those things so that everything on this side of the building is completed. Uh, you see that there's no baseboard around the sanctuary. There's no baseboard across here. Rodney, you've got to do something here. I don't know what that's going to look like, but something. Um, the, the, the prayer room has not been completely finished, trimmed out. Uh, the windows did not come in. They were a specialty item to get that shape, as you can imagine. And uh, they thought they would be last week, and they didn't come in. Well, they didn't come in this week either. And uh, the lighting system for that, the transformers that we got were too small, so they got to be, you know, so there's lots of little things like that. In the bathrooms and stuff, there's paper, uh, paper, towel dispensers and toilet paper dispensers and mirrors and lighting, some of that stuff that didn't get done. We're going to be finishing all that up. That was all within our budget of spending before September 29th. So we want to, we want to be good on what we said we were going to finish. So those things are going to be happening. Uh, the next step for us, and as, as you've had a chilly morning this morning, you'll understand the, 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 the urgency in this. Uh, this building was designed for in-floor heat. So we ran thousand little tubes all underneath your feet. None of that has been hooked up. In fact, we still don't have a gas line coming into this new building. In the next two to three weeks, we hope to change all of that. Uh, and so that's the next thing that our money is going to be going for as money continues to, to come in. Uh, that process of that alone is about $12,000. And so God has continued to be faithful. Man, if I could just tell you, and I wish that in the six years that we've been focused on this, I wish we'd have written a book of the miracles. Because do you realize that nearly every single Sunday over the last six years, I have stood and shared a miracle of something that has happened with a contractor helping us, with people showing up, with money showing up. Oh, truly, this year has been amazing. And when God spoke to me that every time you go to the pot, that, uh, that not the pot, but the pot, that there would be meal and oil, you heard it here, that there would always be meal and oil from the story from Elijah, Hey, that uh, God has been so faithful that everything that we set out to do, God made sure that the money was there. People, if you don't understand how much of a miracle that is, it has been God saying every step of the way, I got this. You're, you're right where I want you. I got you. Trust me. All, and, 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 and I can tell you that all of that came from my prayer of saying, Lord, I'm tired of walking this thing as a step of faith. There are people or there is someone out there that could write one big check and we could just be done. 
And that's what I began to pray for. And that's when God showed me the story of Elijah and said, "Uh uh-uh, it's a walk of faith. And he's done that for other churches. But for here, he's wanted it to be a step of faith, every step of the way showing that he is the one. So that no one can ever say, look what I did. Nobody can say that. Nobody can say that in this church. This has been a God thing from beginning to end. Well, that's with the building and what we need to finish up. But where do we go from here as a church? And if you go back to our day of groundbreaking ceremony, how many were here for the groundbreaking ceremony? On that day, our superintendent then, uh, Pastor Larry Griswold, made this statement. When you get done with your building, you you can have your pastor back. And I remember chuckling at him. And just thinking, whatever, I don't get that. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be pastoring. No. But how prophetic that word has been for my life over the last four and a half years. And the hat that I have had to change to, to, to see this part done, especially in the last six months, it has changed really from feeling like I'm a pastor to feeling like I'm a contractor. When I woke up last Sunday morning, the clock that had been going off in my head stopped. And when I literally stood before you every week saying tick-tock, 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 it's because that is what I have heard in my head for six months. Not one, I don't ever get up with an alarm, and yet my alarm clock was going off about 4.50, 4.55 every day so that I could get here. Sometimes it's close to 5 o'clock. I get up, get dressed, and get here just a few minutes after 5. Day after day after day, because tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. If this was going to be completed, it was going to, be t- it was going to take people working on it. Every day, something had to be done. We had no days to waste. No days to say, hey, let's just take a break. Rest would come on September 30th. Let me tell you, September 30th was a wonderful day of rest. A wonderful day of rest. In fact, last Sunday for me, as the day went on, I just began more and more relaxed. Throughout that day, I, I felt this. I felt as if I was allowed to take off the hard hat, so to speak, and put on my little pastor cap again. And I, I, I want to say... To Brother Griswold, if he were here this morning, oh, I, I'm back. This week I have just felt that. I, I feel, you know what, whatever is left to do, we will get it done. But it is not going to be the focus like it has been over the last four years. It's just not. We have got a place that we can now meet. Those things will happen when they happen. There's no pressure. There's no timeline. It's just going to take care of itself. Some of it may be slower than what we think, but you know what? It's all been on God's God's timetable. So we just continue to let it be on his timetable. But I had this thought this week. Just like, you know, I had lots of people in the last week, two weeks, who have said to me, good job, look what you've done. And I, I, I have tried to stop every single person to say, thank God for what God has done. Because I recognize that there is... There, there's no way that one person did this, including me. None. No way. And in the same way that I didn't do this by myself, I can't move forward today being your pastor, building a church by myself. It's not possible. Nor is it what God wants or intends for any church that the pastor is to do everything. It's time to put focus back on people not on a building. Today, I stand before you and ask for your help. I've been standing before you for four and a half years asking for your help. Hey, can you give a day? Can you give an hour? Can you give a week? Can you give some time? Can you give some money? Can you bring a meal? Can you help here? I've been doing that. And I'm going to stand before you today and ask for your help again. But this way, I'm not asking for help with the building. As I've said, it's, it's going to happen. It's just going to take care of itself at this point. 
But today, I need your help in taking this church and growing this church to do what God wants to do. You say, well, you know what? I'm happy with our little church. Why do we have to grow? Here's the reason. Because there are still people that need Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. We don't grow because of what we think is comfortable or what we like. As long as there is, and I love David Arnett uh, last week talking about drawing the 30-minute the circle, the 30-mile circle. Uh, some of you will remember that I did the same thing when I got here. and It was in my office in the back of my door for a long time. I don't even know what happened to it. Same circle. Never had a clue that David Arnett had done that 20-some years ago. Oh, but as long as there are people within driving distance of this church that don't know the Lord, we are not done. We're not done. And our mentality has to be, well, how, how big are we going to grow? I don't know. But I know this, there's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. You know why churches become ugly? Because they be, get to the place where there's not room for one more. They find their own little group, and there's nothing wrong with having friends at church. There's nothing wrong with having a, a nucleus of friends that you are best friends with. There's nothing wrong with that. However, there always has to be room for others. That your mentality is not keeping people out, but welcoming people. And this goes right along with, with what we're talking about today. And so I'm going to just keep right on moving because as we, we look at our series, we've been looking at the five callings of our life, the five purposes of our life, the five assignments that God has for us to do with our life. Five reasons God created you. We looked at that first calling, which was a calling to be loved. The bedrock of everything else in our life comes down to this, that we must let God love us. We were created to be loved. Created to have a, a relationship with God the Father. And once that we have received His love, we are to love Him back with everything that we are and everything that we have. You know what we call that? Worship. That's what worship is. Loving God with everything you are and everything you have. Worship is not 20 minutes of a service. It's not. We call that worship. Time for praise and worship. And in some people's mind, that's worship. No, worship is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, loving God. That's it. We looked at our second calling in life, which is a call to belong. That we weren't meant to go through life on our own. That God made us to belong with His family. The family of God, which Scripture tells us the family of God is called the church. We're called to belong. We then looked at our third calling in life, which is a calling to become. That once we've given our life to Christ, God does not want us to stay the same. He doesn't want us to be in spiritual diapers for our entire life. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to mature. He wants us to become who He wants us to become. God wants us to grow up and become like His Son, Jesus Christ. And this week, we're going to look at the fourth calling on our lives, and it is this. You are called to bless. You are called to bless other people. How do you do that? You bless other people when you serve them. There are a thousand ways that you can serve the people around you. And when you do that, when you are serving them, you are blessing them. Our text today is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
It says we're God's workmanship. We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, several weeks ago now. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's unique work of art. There's nobody in this world exactly like you. And you were created to do good works in Jesus Christ. Those good works, they're called service. It's called your ministry. It's called your blessing. It's the way you help other people. You weren't made to just take up space, to breathe, to live, to die. God put you on this earth to make a contribution. And that contribu contribution is called your blessing, your ministry to others. If you look at the word servant in Scripture, and you look at the word minister in Scripture, they're the same word in the Greek. The word service and ministry, same thing. In fact, we are all ministers. We're not all pastors. I'm a pastor. That's my vocation. Pastor Dave is a pastor. That's his vocation. Our job is to administer the ministers. Our church has two pastors, but we have many ministers because everyone, every follower of Jesus Christ should be a minister. I've said it often, the saddest day in church history is when people in a pew looked at a guy and said, there's the minister. We pay him to do it. Oh, my job is the pastor. The job of a pastor is to equip the ministers. That is biblical. So that other way of thinking is non-biblical. Or we could say, wrong, as Fonzie used to say. Write this down on your notes here. It says, my life calling is to be a bivocational minister of Jesus. I'll explain this. My life calling is to be a bivocational minister of Jesus. What does bivocational mean? It's like the word bifocal. I have bifocals. Actually, I have trifocals. Without the tri, I can't read the notes in front of me. Okay? I was doing great with bifocals. It started at 40, the last 10 years. From 13 to 40, my eyes never changed. From 40 to 50, I probably had six pair of glasses. So I went from normal to big serious glasses, and all of a sudden, preacher, you need bifocals. And then even with bifocals, I couldn't read the page. So it was now trifocals. But you know, when you get glasses that are bifocals, they allow you to see far away and up close with the same, uh, the same lens. You get to see both with clarity. You know, everything I do in life, if I am a follower of Jesus Christ, is bivocational. If I have a job, in that job, I'm to do two things. Honor God and help others. When was the last time you looked at your job and thought that? Honor God and help others. That's what you're to do in your job. Well, you don't understand my job. No, it doesn't matter what your job is. You're bivocational. See, because we don't take Christianity and just slap it onto our life and say, okay, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and so here's my life the way I've got it all mapped out, and now I'm going to add God. Okay, God, I think I can give you an hour and a half to two hours on Sunday morning if I'm not inconvenienced with something else. I might be able to give you that time. Maybe a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, but maybe not. Okay. Lord, I I'll try to give you three minutes of my morning for quiet time. And so we, we, we take our life as it is, and we try to add God to it. When we give our lives to Christ, God is in control of everything. We don't add God to our busy lives. We 
make time for God and adjust our schedules accordingly. Huh. That doesn't preach well. That doesn't preach well at all. Why? Because we're busy. We're the busiest country on earth. Busy, busy, busy. But if we're going to be a bivocational minister of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a truck driver, or you're a lawyer, or a janitor, or a hospice worker, or a homemaker. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a businessman. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant or a farmer. It doesn't matter who you are or what label you are. If you are a Christian, you are to do it for two reasons. To honor God and help others. I just tell you, some of you need to look at your job right now. Because it's more than just, well, that's where I get my paycheck. How in your job are you honoring God? And how in your job are you helping others? The Bible says it like this in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It says whatever you do, it can be ministry. It can be a blessing if you honor God and help others. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything in life can become a ministry if we honor God and help others. Even menial tasks can become meaningful tasks if we do it out of love for God and for others. Let's just say you're in some kind of a meeting this week, and all of a sudden the meeting's over, and everybody gets, to, gets up to walk out, and they've left coffee cups and napkins and trash and it's not your job to clean it up but you just have the thought I'm going to clean that up it's not my job but I'm just going to honor God and help other people and so while everybody else is leaving you wait and then you clean up instead of expecting that somebody else would come in and do it. You know what you've just done? Ministry. That's ministry. Say, well, I waited till they all got out of the room. Nobody noticed. I should have waited. I should have done it when they were all watching me so they could have all given me a pat on the back. Well, that's one way of doing it. But let's say, you know what? Let's say nobody notices. Do you know that the rewarder of that ministry saw you? did. God saw you. He noticed it. Galatians 1.15 says, God in His grace chose me before I was born and called me to serve Him. This is the fourth purpose of your life. The fourth calling. You are called. You were born to serve. You were created. You were made for ministry. Today, I want to I take our time and wrap this up with looking at four benefits that happen in our lives when we change our focus from self to service. When we change the focus from it's all about me to it's all about serving others. What happens when I begin to use my life for service? When I stop thinking about me all the time and begin to start thinking about other people that God has placed around me, not thinking, how can I be served? How can everybody else please me? But how can I serve others? Serving others and blessing them, I believe, bring four amazing benefits to our life. The first one, of learning to serve unselfishly, the first benefit is that it will create joy in my life. Most people are looking for happiness. Do you know that? Most Americans are looking for something that will make them happy. They look in popularity, 
pleasure, power, possessions, position, prestige. All the P words I could think of. Those are the things that we're typically looking for as Americans. But do you know that every one of those things is temporary? For ongoing joy in your life, it comes by learning to give your life away in service to other people. A good example of this is the Apostle Paul. Philippians 2.17 says, My life is being poured out as a part of the sacrifice and service I offer to God for your faith. Yet I am filled with joy, and I share that joy with all of you. You know, let me pause in the middle of this benefit to give you two principles. Two principles of getting joy into your life. The first principle of getting joy into your life is this. Take the focus off yourself. Philippians 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are unselfish and considerate in all you do. Notice how he pairs joy with being unselfish and considerate. If you are inconsiderate of others, if you are selfish, what he's saying is you're not going to have the joy of the Lord in you. But if you are unselfish and considerate, then the joy of the Lord can be there. The more self-centered you live your life, the more unhappy you will be. The more you focus on you, the more miserable you're going to be. We have to shift our focus from an inward focus of it's all about me. Everything has to make me happy. To an outward focus that says it's all about God and about serving other people. See, that's, that's a good way of, of measuring maturity in Christians. Because there can be people who have been Christians for a long time that don't get this. Who still want everything to please them. And everything has to run through that. It just shows their maturity level. We have to shift our focus. And you know when we do that, it's a countercultural move. Because when we're caught up in that, we are caught up in our culture. Even though we live, boy, don't be caught up in the world. That's exactly what that is. That's a cultural thing. Every advertisement in the world says, it's all about you. Have it your way. You're number one. You're the best. You deserve the best. Everything should make you happy in life. And we buy into that. And we take it to work with us. We take it home with us. We take it to church with us. But when we begin to give our life away, we understand the more that we give our life away to help others, more joy is going to flow into our life. Notice that in people. When you find a miserable Christian, look and see. Second principle of getting joy into your life. Use your gifts to help others. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to make tons of money. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I, some of you said amen. No, no. If you're wondering where I found that, that's in the reviled substandard perversion translation. Oh, <laughs> God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. Passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. Wow, that's beautiful. You are blessed to be a blessing. God blesses you so you can in turn bless others. How do we bless others? By using our skills, our talents our abilities, our time, whatever we've got, when we use it to help others, we bless them. See, God did not put you on this planet 
just for you to live for yourself. You've got to give back. We've got to make a contribution. We've got to be unselfish. That's where joy comes from. All right, back to the benefits. That stuff was free right there. Benefit number two of serving others unselfishly. It will make my life more meaningful. That's maybe a big surprise for some of you. You didn't know that. You know that the only way to really find meaning in your life is to give your life away. God wired the universe on that principle right there. Meaning doesn't come from money, which I just mentioned a minute ago. We think, you know what, if I just get more money, then my life will have more meaning. No, it won't. It won't. Money has some good uses. It can make life easier, that's for sure. Go to a third world country. You become thankful for the money that you have, the conveniences that you have that they don't have. Money can give you opportunities. It can open doors. It can save you time. But money can never give you meaning. No amount of money will ever give your life more meaning. Meaning comes from ministry. It comes from serving, from learning to give your life away. Jesus said it like this, Mark 8.35, if you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. True life from, comes from learning to give my life away. Knowing this, what should my attitude be? 1 Corinthians 15 says, Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your work in the Lord is never wasted. Always give yourself fully. You know, I may not be a lot of things, but that is something that I have tried to live my life by. And whatever you see me doing, I pray that that's lived out in my life, that I am throwing myself into that. When it was the building, it was the building. Now that it's going to be other things, I am going to throw myself in, heart, soul, and everything. It's never wasted. Give yourself fully. The Greek word literally means not half-hearted. You're in. You're all in. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your work in, in the Lord is never wasted. That word wasted means empty, useless, without purpose. Everything you do for Christ has purpose. The Bible says if we find someone and give them a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, that is ministry that He will reward us for in eternity. That's a pretty good picture right there. That's a pretty menial task, isn't it? Offering someone a cup of cold water. Who can't do that? Who can't find something kind to do? The point is, He's taking something really small to say, if you do this, God will reward you for it. Saying that everything you do, God is watching and will reward you. Learning to serve others unselfish, unselfishly gives our life greater meaning. The third benefit of serving others unselfishly is it pours blessing into my life. I almost didn't include this one. Some of you are thinking, well, that would have cut it a little shorter, I know. But do you know, because I don't like people who give because they think they're going to get. Okay? And I don't like that whole principle. We have preachers that preach that. Almost every, every guy on TV preaches that. Oh, give to my ministry and I'll pray the Lord a thousandfold return. You give me a thousand, he'll give you ten thousand. There's, all, there's always you give and then you get. And people aren't giving for the right reason. They're giving to get. But there's a truth here that we can't ignore. 
when I serve in ministry, God pours His blessings upon my life. It is a fact. Life is the lifelong school of learning how to be unselfish. Unfortunately, some people never learn it. Sometimes even believers, followers of Jesus Christ, don't get this. They go through life living for themselves. One of the main tasks of our life is to learn unselfishness. Why? Because God is love. Because God is unselfish. And He wants us to be like Him. So how do I learn to be unselfish? Well, my simple answer is this. Copy Jesus. He lived the most unselfish life. Matthew 20, 28 says this, Your attitude must be like my own. Jesus is speaking. For I did not come to be served, but to serve. Think of that statement. That is the Son of God wrapped in skin. He was 100% man, tempted in all ways like us, but may we never forget he was the Son of God. If he says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. If anybody had a right to be served, do we not know that it was Jesus Christ? It was. And if our leader, our shepherd says, Hey, your attitude has to be like mine. Learn to serve. A lot of church life would be different if believers would catch a hold of that. Because there are believers all across this great land of ours who live by the opposite of that. They go to church to be served. Everything about church must be pleasing to them. It must serve me. You must do it this way. You must do it this way because that's what makes me happy. And you don't want me unhappy as if you're the Incredible Hulk. See, when we take on the attitude of Jesus Christ and we begin to live our life not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others, to help others, to honor God, two incredible things happen. One, you become more like Jesus. And two, you will be more loved and respected than you've ever been. You know, if you want to have more friends, learn to serve people. If you want to be more popular, learn to serve people. If you want people to love you, respect you, learn to be a servant. Romans 14, verse 18 says, If you serve Christ in this way, meaning unselfish, you will please God and be respected by people. Huh, go figure. You want respect? Learn to serve. Learn to have a servant's heart. Here's the cool part of all this. The more I bless other people, the more God blesses me. The more I serve others, the more God honors me. The more I bless other people, the more I minister to other people, the more God ministers to me. Does that mean my life is perfect? Nope. How many know this world reigns on the just and the unjust? And some things, bad things, sometimes bad things happen to good people. It's just a part of the world that we're in. Proverbs 11.25 says, The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever seed I sow, I'm going to get back. But I don't get back a seed. If I plant a seed, I don't get back another seed. 
I get back a, a whole tree of seeds. And if you start blessing other people, you will start getting blessings back. When you start helping other people, you will get more than you bargained for. Blessing others is a scriptural principle that God will bless you. Now, I don't know how he's going to bless you. And I'm not here to stand and tell you it's always going to be a financial thing. Because maybe it won't be a financial thing. There are lots of ways that God can bless us. You know, I hear often, I'd really like to be involved in ministry, preacher, but you don't have a clue how busy I am. I just don't have time to be involved volunteering and helping. I'm just too busy. You know, when I hear those words, my, my heart is sad for them. It's sad. How many blessings in their life do they forfeit because they're too busy? God does not bless selfishness. You want God's blessing on your family? You want God's blessing on your work? And stop thinking about you. Because it's not all about you. God did not put you on this planet to live for you. Understand, the more you give your life away, the more God's blessings will be upon you. And that brings us to the last fourth reason. What will happen if I use my life to serve others, to bless others? If I switch the focus from it's all about me to the, to the focus of how can I serve others? How can I honor God by helping others? fourth benefit of serving unselfishly is it will help me leave a legacy. You know we're all leaving legacies. You are. It doesn't matter what age you are. You are leaving a legacy. You're actually leaving two. One on earth and one in eternity. Now let me just tell you, the one on earth isn't going to last very long. <laughs> That's sad news. But it's true. For most of us in this room, two or three generations from the time that we are passed away, we will not be remembered on this earth. It's true. So why does it even matter? It matters. Especially matters for the second place we can leave a legacy. And that's eternity. You know, when you begin to serve, what it does is it gives you a reputation. Proverbs 10.7 says, Good people will be remembered as a blessing. Let me ask you this. At your funeral, how are you going to be remembered? Man, that person was a real blessing. They lived their life for others. They served. They were always sharing. They were generous. They were kind. They were full of joy. They were always thinking about others. We can only hope. And that person never did anything for anybody else. Always watched out for themselves. Didn't really care about anybody else but them and theirs. They just lived their life and did what they wanted to do. Good people will be remembered as a blessing. You know, the truth is, every one of us want our life to count for something. Deep inside of us, every one of us has this thing of wanting significance. You want your life to have meaning. You want your life to have purpose. You want to do something great with your life. We, everybody has that in them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Do something great with your life. But understand, here's how Jesus talked about it. Hey, if you want to be great, you must be the servant of all. The more you serve, the greater you're going to be. The more you serve, 
the greater influence you have. I'll call it the, the Mother Teresa syndrome. We all know, anybody in this room not know who Mother Teresa is? Do you know that Mother Teresa was a nobody? She was absolutely a nobody who, in her country of India, began ministering to people who were sick and dying. They were the untouchables. She invited them into her home, eventually established places all over that country for them. Do you know that Mother Teresa, before she passed away, was one of the most influential women on this planet? She didn't set out to be that. She just was blessing and serving others. That woman could walk into our Congress. Our, that woman could walk into the United Nations, say, hey, we need to talk. I, I, I don't know that any of us can make that appointment today. Some of us would like to make that appointment with Congress. <laughs> if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be a servant to all. You learn to give your life away. Well, what if nobody sees what I do? It's okay. God sees it. Like cleaning up the table when everybody left. You know, I've always been fascinated in church. I've been a youth pastor, children's pastor. And you know in a church world that parents and people always gripe about the youth room and the children's room and how we don't teach our children to pick up and clean up, but yet those same adults expect someone to follow them in the sanctuary and clean up their mess. Huh? Isn't that funny? That's funny. We'll pay someone to come and clean up after us, but by golly, those children and those teenagers ought to learn how to do that. How about next time we see that mess, we just jump in and clean it up without grumbling, griping, or complaining? Oh, and serve. Do they need to learn those things? Yes, they do. They do. Hebrews 6.10, God is fair. He will not forget the work you did and the love you showed for him by helping his people. And he will remember that you are still helping them. Jesus makes this promise in John 12, 26, My Father will honor anyone who serves me. You know that's more important than winning the Nobel Peace Prize, the Congressional Medal of Honor. We have big ceremonies for those things and the, the applause and the accolades of men. I tell you what, this is a greater honor that my Heavenly Father would honor me for serving Him. If you want to leave a legacy that's worth remembering, start serving unselfishly. Doing something with your life that you don't get back anything for. You've heard me say it before, but the greatest use of our life is to invest it in something that outlasts it. We all have three choices with our life. We can waste our life, we can spend our life, or we can invest our life. The best use of your life is to invest it in something that will outlast it. And there are, according to Scripture, only two things that are going to outlast this world. The Word of God and people. So if you're building your life upon the Word of God and investing in people, you are building your life upon things that are going to last into eternity. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning.